Cool. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for sticking around. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, how fossil biomolecules can be used to learn something about dinosaur paleobiology. And uh, because it's going to be a longer talk, I thought it's a good idea to start with a very quick overview. So um, I'll give you a short introduction of um, what we know about biomolecule fossilization. Then I'll tell you a little bit more about our latest research on protein fossilization. I'll introduce Raman spectroscopy, my method of choice. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the stabilization of three-dimensional tissue morphologies in deep time. And then we can use uh, all this combined knowledge to uh, extract paleobiological information from fossil biomolecules. So let's get started. Soft tissues consist generally of lipids, polysaccharides, and proteins. And um, all three are major structural biomolecules that are responsible for almost all organismic form and organismic function. And um, proteins are some of the major types of compounds um, that uh, are incredibly important when it comes to generating morphology. And uh, they are directly related to an organism's genetic code, what makes them biologically incredibly interesting. Proteins are organized on overall four hierarchical levels, ranging uh, from the molecular structure in uh, the primary protein structure, um, over secondary and tertiary structures to a quaternary structure that is basically a complex, heterogeneous uh, tissue architecture. And um, so when we think about uh, applying proteins for biological uh, questions, then uh, we end up basically with uh, three different types of applications. And uh, as an example, I'm using um, extant dinosaurs um, because later on we want to apply it to non-avian dinosaurs. So um, whenever we want to learn something about evolution, we can sequence proteins and figure out how different animals are related to each other. Um, we can use protein-bound pigments and the particular binding motifs to learn more about mating strategies and dietary habits. And we can look at what is called um, post-translational modifications, uh, which are directly related to metabolic capabilities. And so um, later on, we want to apply all these uh, three different aspects to non-avian dinosaurs. But to do so, we have to start with uh, the very basics of molecular preservation. And um, so when we talk about biomolecule fossilization, we have to think about three major types of compounds that uh, we do know fossilize. A first class um, contains lipids and polysaccharides, so basically structural macromolecules that preserve uh, through peroxidation processes. Um, then we have uh, some evidence for morphological preservation of proteinaceous structures, like, for example, cells and blood vessels from dinosaur bones. However, that's a quite controversial discussion, and um, we're still missing proper convincing evidence for how this type of preservation is supposed to happen. Um, a third class of biomolecules that commonly fossilizes includes what is called uh, secondary metabolites. So they are these very small, incredibly stable, low-weight uh, molecules that uh, can preserve either as biomolecules, uh, as biopolymers, or uh, in a completely unaltered way through chelation. And today we want to focus especially on proteins. So when we think about protein fossilization, um, it is very important to look at uh, a time window that is called early diagenesis, which is basically the time frame um, of, um, of reactions occurring directly post-mortem. As a model system, um, I chose hard tissues for the simple reason that um, when we're looking for proteins, we're looking for compounds that are so teeny tiny that uh, macroscopically we would have no chance to find them all around. And um, so we target those types of tissues that commonly fossilize. And uh, in dinosaurs, just as in all other vertebrates, that is heart tissues. Heart tissues have a very general, very simple makeup that uh, they all share. We basically have uh, an uh, organic matrix that holds the mineral crystallites in place. And uh, we have uh, then vascular canals that supply nutrients and uh, are connected through cells that rest in this extracellular matrix. So post-mortem, uh, we basically bury our heart tissue that contains all these potentially proteinaceous compounds. And what happens then is that uh, fluids that percolate through the uh, rock that buries our heart tissues 
uh, start to flush the entire system through the vascular canals that are interconnected through filipodia, through cells. Um, so we basically have a lot of chemistry that can potentially go on here at the interface between the pore waters that have a specific iron load uh, that they take up from the surrounding rock matrix and the organic lining. And so when we think about the chemical conditions that, uh, that actually uh, prevail uh, during earliest diagenesis, we have to think about very alkaline conditions, uh, no matter what type of hard tissue we're actually looking at. And under very alkaline conditions with water saturation and presence of certain catalytic agents, um, the, the general reaction scheme that people uh, assumed would happen um, is actually hydrolysis. And so here we're actually talking about one of the biggest problems um, surrounding the topic of protein fossilization. It has been assumed for many years that proteins just completely decay away within less than 3.8 million years, which is paleontologically speaking not very long. Um, and so hydrolysis is basically the addition of water to uh, the amide bond, which is um, also diagnostic for proteins. It's called the peptide bond. And this reaction basically frees the different compounds that make up our protein so that they can get eventually washed out and completely disappear. If we wanted to have our proteins fossilizing, we would need a process that could potentially antagonize hydrolysis, that, uh, a process that acts really fast and the process that can potentially occur under the given conditions. And um, there is only one candidate mechanism, um, which is called cross-linking, oxidative cross-linking through advanced glycoxidation and lipoxidation. And so with this particular process, we would transform a certain amino acid residues uh, under given conditions to nitrogen heterocyclic polymers. If we wanted to test for this scenario, we would have to look at a set of different samples and we would have to find evidence for the transformation of proteins. And so we thought this is a very testable hypothesis. And we started out compiling a comprehensive sample set including various types of heart tissues, uh, in this case uh, teeth uh, and enamel scales, bones, eggshells, and um, a bunch of different control samples about which I'm going to talk later a little bit more. Um, our samples ranged in age from late Triassic to modern, came from all over the world, um, and can be um, basically um, located for uh, the positional environments that uh, can be categorized as either oxidative or reducing in the local chemistry. We have a bunch of dinosaurs in there, uh, just saying. Um, so what we basically did is that we took our different heart tissue samples, cut out teeny tiny aliquots, and dissolved them. Um, we dissolved the mineral matrix um, and looked out for any sorts of residues because everything that should be left over after dissolving the mineral matrix should be in theory organic. And uh, we actually got precipitates that, uh, that uh, were strongly biased towards samples from oxidative taphonomic environments. And in the next slides, I'm going to take you through the highlights of preservation, um, so the types of structures that are uh, that commonly preserved. For our tooth and enamel scales, we got these, um, these uh, articulated vascular systems that uh, in this particular case had still thousands of teeny tiny nerve projections that you can commonly find at the dentine ganoin border preserved. Um, for our bone samples, we had uh, a set of different soft tissues that are commonly preserved in uh, our samples from oxidative deposition environments, including uh, extracellular matrix here, and in this case still fibrous, um, sometimes with osteocytes that were still connected, sometimes without, and fragmentary vascularity, so basically blood vessel fragments, that uh, in some extraordinary preserved cases still had a stratified, uh, stratified vascular wall. It should be noted that all the soft tissues that we extracted from uh, fossil materials had this characteristic brownish stain, as you can see. For our eggshells, we got as the most commonly preserved soft tissues these uh, sheath-like structures, which, um, which seem to resemble the uh, original organic matrix in the eggshell. However, now that we had all these soft tissues, we of course wanted to figure out what they were composed of in terms of chemistry. And uh, to do so, um, we've used Raman spectroscopy. Raman spectroscopy is a very powerful, non-destructive in-situ tool that uh, allows you to 
characterize general trends in the chemical composition of your samples. So what it basically does is that you shoot a green laser, in our case green laser, uh, on your sample, and this green laser initiates characteristic vibrations in your sample molecules. These characteristic vibrations um, give, a, give a very diagnostic change in the frequency of uh, the emitted light that we see here, um, which allows uh, us then to uh, eventually uh, separate the signals for different types of molecular units that start to vibrate, um, enhance it, amplify it, and eventually we end up with uh, spectra that give us these uh, peaks and uh, bands, which are then characteristic for the different types of molecular, molecular units in our samples. So here we're basically looking at Raman spectra. And um, these have like lots of teeny tiny peaks. Reasoning for that is that we have very heterogeneous compounds in our fossil products, fossil organic matter. Um, but we're focusing here on general trends, and uh, I've highlighted the general trends here with these colorful bands. So we're basically going from, uh, from extant material to uh, over uh, experimentally matured material to fossil samples. And what we see is that um, as we basically increase the maturation degree of our samples, we see an increase in this peak at 1,580 uh, wave numbers. And this one is characteristic for nitrogen heterocyclic polymers. So basically the type of oxidative transformation products that we proposed for oxidative cross-linking. Um, on the other hand, we see that these two flanking bands here, um, which represent amide bonds, so basically peptide bonds, um, decrease in their signal intensity um, significantly uh, from, from fresh to fossil materials. And this is a trend that we basically observe in uh, almost all our samples. Um, here for our uh, bone samples, the spectra are a little bit cleaner because um, we had larger chunks of extracellular matrix preserved, so less textural effects that eventually uh, added some noise to our spectra. Um, we also performed experimental maturation that shows um, quite nicely that uh, artificial protein oxidation can produce under the right conditions um, morphologically very similar discoloration compared to what we see in our fossil soft tissue extracts. Um, in our fossil actions, we see exactly the same. So um, with this, we basically um, went on and thought, okay, we want to statistically characterize the signals that we see in our data. And so for that, we basically took our Raman spectra and uh, converted them to so-called variance-covariance matrices that can be run as principal component analyses. Um, so every dot here basically represents a whole spectrum of a, of a particular hard tissue. And um, so here in this figure, we basically uh, have uh, two characteristic clusters. Um, we have one group here that contains all our proteinaceous compounds from uh, different hard tissues. And then we have another group in here that uh, represents all our control samples. Our control samples included humic acids, um, various types of uh, polyacrylamide glues, um, samples from reducing environments that we analyzed as in situ samples. So what we basically see is that uh, these two classes do not overlap. That tells us that uh, fossil soft tissues are not the product of contamination uh, of anything that is here among our control samples. If we go one step further and basically remove our control samples to get a better idea about what happens in our, uh, in our proteinaceous tissues, we see that um, we have here this group of, uh, of fresh proteins, of fresh proteinaceous material. We have here our group of, um, in red, of, uh, of our fossil protein fossilization products, or whatever we want to call them. Um, and these two groups, they don't touch each other. So this basically tells us that, uh, again, our fossil proteins um, are not the product of modern fauna contamination. Moreover, the really interesting part is that uh, this orange group that represents our experimental protein oxidation bridges perfectly our cluster of fresh and fossil samples. That is quite promising. So um, just to highlight the general changes that we observe uh, in our material for time, I've created this very small graphic. So um, here we basically see the net changes, the net compound enrichment through time, which equals on the positive side 
only nitrogen and sulfur-rich heterocycles. Quite interesting. We lose everything else that would be diagnostic for a protein. At the first date, <coughs> excuse me. At the first date, we're looking at a peptide here um, that is uh, unaltered, fresh. Um, beautiful as it should be. Um, then at the second stage of alteration, we start to introduce these non-crosslinking compounds, which uh, can be uh, nitrogen heterocyclic or sulfur heterocyclic in nature. Then on the third stage, we start to introduce these cross-linking nitrogen and sulfur-rich heterocycles. Um, and eventually, at the last stage, with more temperature and pressure overprinting, we start to denitrify and end up with what people would call a melanoidine. However, the types of compounds that we most commonly see in our fossil soft tissues equal these stage three compounds. Um, at that point, we wanted to figure out um, what sort of spatial coverage we do have for the different types of fossilization products. And um, so we basically mapped out different compounds over the surface of extracted soft tissues that uh, came in this case from an Allosaurus. So this is like Jurassic material, it's pretty old. Here we look at nitrogen heterocycles, which make up the majority of the compounds that can be found in our fossil soft tissues. Um, then I mapped out pentosidine. Pentosidine is a classic biomarker for these uh, so-called advanced glycoxidation end products. And we see that the correspondence is pretty good between these two. Uh, makes a lot of sense because pentosidine is eventually a nitrogen heterocycle. Um, I've mapped out uh, amides, which would be characteristic for the peptide bond, which we propose should be consumed during the cross-linking process. And uh, quite interestingly, we see that the maximum coverage, so like the highest signal points on our sample surface correspond to those areas that are not that well covered in nitrogen heterocycles, so areas that are not that much cross-linked. Um, we mapped out sulfur-rich heterocycles. Sulfur-rich heterocycles can only be formed through uh, endogenous uh, cystineal residues in, uh, in our proteins, and so we would expect to have much less spatial coverage and this is exactly what we see. However, the spatial coverage corresponds pretty well with nitrogen heterocycles and pentosidine, what makes a lot of sense since they are formed through the exact same processes. Uh, should be noted that we can't, of course, not be exactly sure that the amides that we're mapping out here are of proteinaceous origin and represent sheltered regions. Um, they could be potentially also of diagenetic origin. Okay, very quick look at 3D morphological preservation of different tissue types. So um, we see that um, even though our heart tissues are quite often sort of distorted, uh, or like minimally distorted in their morphology, the soft tissues that we extract do not show any shape change at all. And that is quite remarkable. Um, so what we figured out is that uh, once we um, incubate our soft tissues for a little bit longer in uh, aqueous solutions, you get precipitation of iron oxides on the surface. And that brought us to the idea that uh, eventually one key to the three-dimensional stabilization of these soft tissues could be, could be chelation. And um, so in this case, we look at an average spectrum of the uh, nitrogen heterocycle fingerprint region of a protein fossilization product. And so we basically see this bump here that shows up continuously in all of our samples. This one is characteristic for, uh, for transition metal chelation. I've just put iron here because iron is probably the most abundant transition metal that we have in most types of sediments and rocks. Um, we've mapped out iron uh, over fossil osteocytes. And what we see is that the distribution uh, in our fossil materials does not equal the natural accumulation centers of iron in a cell, but we have uh, basically full coverage wherever we have protein fossilization products, corroborating the idea that chelation might play an important role. So very quick summary for the chemical part. We've learned that uh, proteins can cross-link uh, during fossilization, this is how they preserve. Um, the nitrogen-rich amino acid residues, uh, arginine, lysine, and histidine, end up forming nitrogen heterocycles. Sulfur-rich amino acid residues, cysteine basically, uh, end up forming sulfur-rich heterocycles. These types of compounds that we get in our fossils here are hydrophobic, resistant to microbial decay, and energetically very, very stable. They can be afterwards chelated, what contributes to the three-dimensional stabilization. So now we have the basics to actually apply all that. And here it's getting more exciting. Um, so I want to talk today about three potential applications of protein fossilization products to paleobiology. 
On one hand, we can use them to identify tissue types based on the AGE to ALE ratio. So we're looking at the specific uh, concentration and composition of advanced decoxidation end products to, relative to advanced lipoxidation end products. We can characterize metabolic rates in, uh, in fossil animals by uh, analyzing the overall baseline AGE and ALE concentrations uh, from our samples. And we can potentially draw phylogenetic inferences based on the characteristic, com uh, characteristic composition and concentration of nitrogen heterocycles relative to sulfur-rich heterocycles. So we're talking here about a very different concept. This has nothing to do with, with sequencing at all. Okay, so just to sum up what types of compounds uh, are of interest here, um, you see we're looking at very different types of compounds. Um, we're targeting protein fossilization products on very different levels to mine paleobiological information. And so here are some examples. Um, tissue type identification, why is that relevant to you guys? Well, if you find an amazing fossil in the field, uh, let's say this particular dinosaur, and you find it has some sort of a hard tissue mass in its belly region, uh, that could be potentially stomach content, that could be potentially an egg, whatever it is, it is pretty exciting. However, your fossil is too valuable for destructive sampling. And uh, in that case, you could just use in-situ analytics and analyze based on the preserved protein fossilization products what type of hard tissue you have. And so as an example here, I've used uh, a set of uh, 25 hard tissue samples that all had soft tissue preservation, and I fingerprinted the protein fossilization products and uh, that's uh, basically highlighted here. It's like the loadings across PC1. Um, we get a very nice uh, separation between clusters of eggshells, bones, and teeth. That could be even better if I had included some more teeth, uh, which is mainly based on the specific composition and amounts of advanced glycoxidation and lipoxidation end products. A second application would be physiology. Physiology is quite interesting to us paleontologists, and we've tried several times to approach especially metabolic rates. We've used histology to learn about growth rates, growth, growth lines were counted, and uh, based on that we tried to infer overall metabolic rates, but that comes with, it, with its own challenges. And so we can use protein fossilization products to actually uh, not only qualitatively, but quantitatively get an idea about the evolution of metabolic rates in extinct animals. How does it work? We characterize this uh, particular baseline concentration for AGEs and ALEs. And we do this by including samples of the same hard tissue type from the same or comparable depositional environments to reduce the overall noise that we have in our samples. And uh, with that, uh, we can, in the future, hopefully learn more about uh, dinosaur physiology. Okay, here's the third concept, uh, phylogeny. And um, so I should point out that here we're not looking at any sequence data at all. We're looking at uh, these uh, non-proteinaceous protein fossilization products um, that we fingerprinted and analyzed for the specific composition of nitrogen to sulfur-rich heterocycles. And uh, just based on this particular composition, we can get a very good idea about large-scale phylogenetic relationships in, in this case, vertebrates. Uh, here are two dinosaurs. Um, we're trying to apply this, um, this strategy to learn more about the phylogenetic placement of turtles and stem turtles um, and to get a better idea about uh, actual evolution. However, I should say that all these types of applications come with their limitations. Um, obviously, the minimum requirement is that we have soft tissue preservation. And we find soft tissues preserved only in, uh, as I mentioned, oxidative taphonomic settings. We need water in the original burial environment present and uh, ideally catalytic agents like, for example, phosphate or any sort of transition metal. And uh, as we know, we have a, a very tight linkage between the depositional environment and the early diagenetic chemo milieu. And once we start to look at um, the data I've presented, we can sum up that uh, eventually it's very likely to find soft tissues preserved in the Aeolian sandstones, fluvial and alluvial sandstones, and shallow marine limestones. So uh, some last words on um, potential future challenges. Um, we've learned today that uh, protein fossilization products um, contain signal that uh, represents the original tissue type, um, that represents the original metabolism of an animal, that has uh, some sort of um, protein sequence input, um, but this is all kind of overprinted by a potential taphonomic signal loss. And so in the future, 
we yet definitely have to improve the signal separation between these different uh, paleobiological levels of information. Um, we have to better understand how these different signals are affected by taphonomic loss and by taphonomic overprinting. And uh, it is very important that we start to acquire spectroscopic data under standardized protocols to make them more comparable, because this whole approach is, is very comparative in nature. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank Palas for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I have to thank a bunch of people all listed here, and there are many more that didn't fit on the page, uh, and of course all my funders. Thank you very much.